Patrick, so step one of our restoration plan is already done and yes. we are only f five days into it. The whole logic thing is working. Okay, tomorrow rope modules. So we're testing the rope driver modules. We're following the NASA test plan and verifying that everything's working correctly. And this module mostly drives current pulses, right? So yeah. I see I see pulses on, on your stuff. So, so it's driving the inhibit lines to select a particular core within the, the rope module. And is it working? So far, yeah. So we are we are putting the uh, tested memory support module in the AGC for the next step where we will put the uh, rope simulator in. If you thought core memory was complicated, you haven't yet seen core rope memory. Core rope is only vaguely related to traditional erasable core memory and its principle of operation is very different. First off, it is a read-only memory. It is called rope because the early memories really look like ropes, like this one. But the Apollo core rope looks nothing like a rope. Instead, it looks like this well-organized construction. The ferrite cores used in ropes are much larger than the microscopic ones used for erasable memory. It's the big orange core on the left, which you can compare to the minuscule erasable cores to the right. Each Apollo rope modules use 512 cores arranged in two layers of 256. And the core magnetization state isn't even used to keep the bit value in memory at all. Instead, a core is just an addressable current pulse generator. Whether a bit is read as a 1 or a 0 only depends on whether a sense wire goes through the core or around it. Looking closer, you can actually see the wires that go in and others that avoid the cores entirely. Addressing and bit sensing is crazy. The large core that traverses by tens of addressing wires will inhibit wires even though they don't inhibit anything. Hundreds more sense wires, grouped in selectable strands of 16-bit words each, are used to code the bits. So a single core is traversed by hundreds of wires, up to 192 for the bits and 10 or so for addressing. At 192 bits per core, it is much denser than erasable core, and that's why it was used. The AGC has room for 6 core rope modules, representing 36 kilowards of fixed memory, or 72 kilobytes in modern parlance, but it only had 2 kilowards of erasable memory in comparison. The ropes were weaved once the program had been finished. This was done by threading the sense wires in or around the cores. First it was done by hand with two operators and eventually semi-automated with the machine you see here that guided the operator needle through the right place. It took a month to weave a set of ropes. It was of course utterly impractical during program development, so our AGC doesn't even have core rope modules. It came with core rope simulator boxes instead, which connected to a mainframe computer and simulated core rope memory during development. So what we're doing today is what I've been working on since November, which is these core rope simulator boxes that have been plugged in in place of the actual core rope. So the Core rope boxes have been a pain in the butt for uh, Ken to reverse engineer. So I spent a long time reverse engineering the boxes, tracing out all the wiring, and generated a schematic of how it's wired up, and then figured out what they're trying to do and how we can give it the right signals from a beagle bone. So, so it's a combination of TTL logic and some weird analog stuff. So with the, the, cord, the cordwood section here is the analog circuitry pulse transformers to interface to the AGC. And then in here is digital logic, standard TTL, mostly doing address decoding. What these do is they allow us to um, load code from the BeagleBone, uh, word by word, into the AGC as the AGC requests it. These boxes were used for ground testing. 
so that they could provide whatever test code they wanted without having to weave new ropes. I've loaded Aurora 12 onto my BeagleBone and it should be provided through this interface to the core rope boxes to the AGC. So you're on? Yeah. And I see no lights on the panel. That's, that's good. Mm -hmm. It did what I wanted to do. I have not allowed it to perform any memory cycles yet. We're going to try just a single memory cycle. 4,000. Okay. Entry point. Okay, I, I saw, yeah. I, I saw, I saw access it. and then it looks like it got cancelled by a, um, a clear signal. So the problem is that the BeagleBone is getting the signal that the rope access is starting, so at least that is working, but it's not getting the signal that the address is correct, so it doesn't proceed with the read. So you have now your scope attached? Yep. 4,000 read preset. Well, you got something. Okay. So this is, you are, so you are getting a reset signal, though you were, so were worrying we didn't get them. Right. So the signal we see here yeah. never got to the beagle bone. Uh, Mike <laughs> thinks he has figured out why our rope uh, emulator doesn't work. Okay. So. Uh, phase 4 of T10 is when the rope cycle starts. Because the, the read cycle takes two MCTs to execute. So what does this mean for, for me? What does it mean? <laughs> what does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? I'm sending test data, which is just binary counting. So we should see the four bits counting up in binary. You get them. Those are, those are your bits, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. So, so this means we're getting data at least four, bit, four bits through all this circuitry into the AGC. Oh, this is our lost bit. Yep. We we had we had to take the big guy with the differential amplifier to figure out where it was. We have a, a loose yellow wire here. It's not connected to anything. And this is for sense line ten, so well this is the second problem we found on that same bit because the, we also found the shorted pin. Well yeah, it was a short and, and an open. Plus all you think they'd cancel out. <laughs> <laughs> This must. This is the. Nine, this is the tenth repair I'm making on that box. This is an original weld. And you can see how it's corroding. So that's a weld. This is another one that I have resoldered. This is an original weld. So it's an area where the welds have corroded and they're all popping off. Okay, so it's repaired for now. Retheon box with tenth bit added. Hopefully. I have the, uh, the differential mode plugin, so a pair of coaxes going to there and doing the sand amp, which is differential signal, a few tens of millivolts. Right, mm -hmm. it's, it's couldn't get it with the modern scope. Four thousand. Hey, no. How does your da data look? So right now we have a group of 1,024 bytes, or sorry, 1,024 words that are correct, and then a group of 1,024 words that are wrong. So we have a stuck address bit somewhere so for some reason. So black's good, red's wrong. Yep. We need to take out the boxes again, the flaky Raytheon boxes, find out which contact's wrong. This problem turned out to be one we could diagnose fairly quickly. The problem was one of the memory banks, it was going to the wrong address. Um, Mike told me that it was um, strands 1 through 4 on module R2. That led me directly to a particular pin on one of the chips. So I think we can conclude that DS1E5, 1E here has a bad contact. Uh, Mark will do his magic, bend the pins, improve the contact, and then everything should work. I've been anointed the master 
contact so bender. Sure so the bottom chip. And it's making contact both on the outside, on the it, it, inside and outside of the contacts, and the things have bent out of shape, and they don't make very good contact. It's not a corrosion problem; it's purely mechanical. And we tried several solutions, but the one that works the best is to have the special long nose pliers that work fine and bend them in the perfect arc, so they do contact on the inside and the outside. So it's it's really a stupid solution but it made all the difference in the box dipstick is yes yes it's a pathetic system it's very very unreliable and, you know if the agc was like this we would have been years into it it still be yeah, false that's the one where i had to replace the pin too okay try it again So we got the Raytheon boxes, we got rid of the shorts and the bad contacts and all, all that other jazz. Uh, but we were still uh, reading bad memory from it and so I have Mike running it and you can see he has the, the yellow lights, it's restarting yeah. all the time. Lots of restarts, lots of experiments. So, it's running a little bit, but then it runs into trouble. Mm -hmm. Then we instrumented it and start to look at the memory transactions. And uh, cleverly, uh, Mike with his FPGA was able to track where it was making errors. And that's this little glitch at the bottom. And now if I move on one of the glitch, we could finally see what was happening. And it's somewhat hard to explain, but there are two signals on the top that should come down at the same time, and this is part of of the memory access. And you see that the green one is slightly slow compared to the blue one. It's just enough that it lets a little bit through, and that's what we get at the other end of a transformer. It gets generated into a signal a signal bit and makes an error. It's very very small. It's 500 nanoseconds, which is much smaller than what the AGC should see. Which tells us that this box probably never worked on our computer, and we had to do a little fix. So we, we, we just, um, decided to put a small capacitor across that signal, just enough to, to block the glitch transient. And so if I put the capacitor into the circuit, so this should filter out the glitch, but let through the real signal, and so what do we see, Mike? We're, I mean, we're up and running now. We're not getting any more fixed parity alarms, and uh, I can interact with luminary. So let me solder those capacitors in place for good. Those two little capacitors make all the difference between the thing not working at all and the thing working perfectly. So we think we have our core ropes, books from hell, working again. So now I look at it, and the capacitor was enough to filter the output of a transformer. And now, miraculously, we are working out of core rope memory. For the first time in a long while, the computer it's using its own memory, the, the core rope, the simulated core rope at this time. So that's a significant step. It also tells us that we can likely dump the ropes at the Computer History Museum. Mm -hmm. So now the only thing to make it entirely uh, functional would be to get the erasable memory to work and we are not that far from it. Mm -hmm. So to summarize, two days of debugging, two capacitors is the solution. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So we have the holy coral ropes.